Welcome. This is Watchman Privacy. I'm Gabriel Custodiot. If you like this listener-supported show and you want it to succeed and improve, please consider supporting it through one of the methods listed at watchmanprivacy.com. I have a privacy guide sold on Amazon, courses, and consulting. Free methods of supporting includes leaving positive reviews, subscribing to me wherever you can, Twitter, YouTube, Odyssey, etc., and sharing my work. Find links in the description or at watchmanprivacy.com. Your support determines the future of this show. Thank you. Welcome, everyone, to the Watchman Privacy Podcast. I'm very pleased today to be joined by Joe Doran, uh, who is a, uh, a writer, uh, a journalist, uh, various things. And I encountered Joe while reading Trends Journal. That's trendsjournal.com, uh, which is uh, created by Gerald Salente, who is, who is quite a character. And it's, a, it's an excellent resource, which publishes basically every week a 120-page PDF of of news and also interpretation of that news. Um, and it's uh, just a fantastic resource. I would recommend you certainly to check it out. And Joe in uh, Trends Journal writes a section where he's talking about things like privacy, big tech, impending technology that could hinder our freedoms, censorship, all of that kind of good stuff. And I noticed recently that he had actually published a book called Leaving Humanity, The Corrupt Designs of Technocratic Elites on Amazon. And then he published another book called Dehuman, Essays on the Degrowth, Decarbon, and Decrypto War on Real Human Progress. So very interested to hear what he has to say. Joe, welcome to the show. How are you? Uh, I'm doing great, Gabriel. I, I thank you very much for having me on. Um, I've looked at your Watchmen uh, you know, podcast. You're doing fantastic work yourself. And uh, so you're to be con- congratulated for fighting the good fight. Well, I appreciate that. And, you know, Joe, I was, I was surprised not to find much on you. Are you sure you don't have an Instagram, a Twitter, maybe a good old Snapchat? <laughs> How can you live with yourself? <laughs> I have YouTube. <laughs> you can find me pretty easily on YouTube. You know, uh, and a lot of what I do has nothing to do with, uh, you know, political or technocracy or, or any, you know, or crypto, which I write about in the Trends Journal. You know, I have uh, a lot of different hats uh, I've worn. Uh, in my life, uh, everything from uh, creating music, uh, s- singer-songwriter stuff. Um, I used to be in a new wave band back in the '80s. Theater stuff. You know, I've I've had theater troops and and produced theater and been an actor, been a director, been a writer, playwright. And, and all the stuff you just mentioned that that's way too that's way too happy and bright for this show. So <laughs> let, let, let's get into the the dangerous future. But before we get into that stuff, I'm just curious, how did you get talking about all of this? What were some of your, and maybe what were some of your kind of wake up calls throughout the years, whether that was a book or a person or something like that? How did you get thinking about these things? Well, you know, I, I go way back just as a person, as a human being, you know, I'm, get, I'm getting older every year, like we all are, but, um, you know, I'm 58 years old now, you know, born in 64. Um, you know, I was born in an age, you know, there was an optimistic view of everything, really. Uh, I, I think still as a kid, a great residue of that that I had. Um, grew up with sci-fi, you know. Sci-fi was just, you know, something I loved in movies. Um, yeah, there were Planet of the Apes and the apes were taken over. And, and there was, you know, Omega Man and there was Soylent Green and stuff like that. But um, there was also just an idea that technology could make things better, I read so much, so many different sci-fi authors, so many different fantasy authors. Um, But, you know, coming across people like C.S. Lewis, started to read other stuff by him that wasn't really sci-fi. It was more, you know, social, philosophical commentary, you know. The abolition of man. Yes, exactly. You know, so that's where I first came across, you know, some of these ideas about uh, a darker side to uh, technology and technological so-called progress. I, you know, did I grok everything at the time and, and understand where it might lead? No, because I was reading this stuff, you know, circa 1976, 77, 78, you know, Dune reading uh, Tolkien. You know, when you read Tolkien as a kid, and I, I, I literally did, I read it in the seventh grade. I picked up uh, Fellowship of the Ring. It just looked like a cool cover. <laughs> um, you know, I'd already read books like uh, John Christopher's The White Mountain Trilogy. Uh, that, you know, that introduced me to like ideas of dystopia, you know, control. This kid, everybody at a certain age to make this population put on these special helmets 
And from there on, your life changes and, you, and you're controlled, essentially. And this kid ends up bringing the whole thing down. He enters this city of the aliens and they have a, literally a different atmosphere. And he, he goes through and he ends up being the, the force that brings it all down, you know. So I'd read books like that. But when I read Tolkien, I, I was reading it, um, you know, the way a kid enjoys an adventure story, Um you know, John Carter from Mars or whatever, all those books I read. It was only later on that I really started to understand and think more about what Tolkien was talking about with regard to, you know, the problems of power, for example. Um, I try not to let politics run my life. I know you, you mentioned uh, I'm too happy, but when I get together with Gerald and, and we get together occasionally, we go out for dinner. You know, Gerald, he feels the weight of the world and you see it in his broadcasts a lot. You see it when he's on his, you know, his podcast, when he's doing the Trends Journal stuff. And, you know, sometimes, I, you know, I say, hey, Gerald, let's get out, man. Let's just go hang out. You know, we can fight the battle, but at some point you're living a life, too. And, and don't don't lose that. Don't let them take away your sense of joy your sense of your own life, your sense of happiness, your sense of family, whatever, whatever things you enjoy, just to spite them, keep on doing it and keep on enjoying your life. We do want to have a good understanding of philosophy and, and ethics and some of the humanities uh, disciplines that you were talking about. Um, just like, for example, you mentioned C.S. Lewis. He has, he has this great line in The Abolition of Man where he talks about, he has this line, he says, the final stage will come when, when man through, through eugenics and conditioning and all this other kind of stuff will finally have control over himself. He'll be able to choose what he wants to be, change himself. He will have won the battle, but who precisely will have won that battle? Um, mm. is how he finishes that line. And so there, there's a lot of interesting uh, stuff there, but you, you also mentioned uh, science fiction. And let, let, let's start there because a lot of science fiction is is dystopian. You have, of course, Brave New World, 1984, uh, you know, 2001, A Space Odyssey, The Matrix. We have all these examples, uh, you know, iRobot, where the things that, you know, whether that's AI or robotics um, or, you know, conditioning or, you surveillance, you name it, all of these things, we have grown up watching these develop a, a life of, of their own. Um, they, they go out of control and they end up harming us. And so we grow up on all these stories. And it shocks me how people these days are like, yeah, you know, AI, let's let's keep doing it. You know, let's, oh, you know, uh, CRISPR and gene editing. Oh, that sounds like a good idea. Like, haven't we all listened to these stories? So wh what do you think is is going on? We have all these examples of technology gone wrong. And yet we're just kind of walking straight towards it. And there's not a whole lot of people even blowing the whistle. They're just kind of accepting it, encouraging it. Well, I think you mentioned uh, something about C.S. Lewis that's that's very insightful in his thinking. And when you look at that line and when you look at more broadly his writing, what he's getting at is that the problem ultimately is and the limitation ultimately is us. It's not really our things. It's not really technology per se. It's in human nature. There are limits in ourselves that we had we had do we would do well to respect, to acknowledge, and to be humble about. Where where there is a lack, where there is a humble or a humility deficit, there lies trouble. When you look at technocrats, you know, let's let's look let's look at our primary example of a technocrat today, you know. Uh everybody knows him. He, he he's he's on TV, he's been on TV for the past three and a half years. Anthony Fauci. What does this guy exemplify? Uh, it, to me, it's arrogance. It's just palpable how arrogant this person is in in the way they carry themselves in the way they pontificate, in the way they know. They know. He knows. He has a certitude about what he's doing, what he's proposing, who he is and his goodness and his good intentions. And don't, don't question that. He doesn't question it in himself. And he expects that that gives him 
some kind of authority and some kind of license to do what needs to be done. I mean, that's that's where he goes wrong is in his hubris, in his arrogance. And that's a lot of what defines this technocratic point of view. I recall another guy out there kind of um, in a similar vein, Neil deGrasse Tyson, the, the popular astrophysicist who goes around on all these shows. He, he had a line where he, he says, look, science is the only method we have to find the truth. Like he, he literally said that. I mean, it's entirely the opposite. The scientific method's been very useful, but it literally does not find truth. It only finds probability. So for, for people just to go around saying that kind of stuff, um, you know, the, the, the concept of science as this is a, you know, this is a, this is a rule book and we just have to follow it and we get to the end as opposed to science as a history of overturning fallacious ideas with, with better ideas and, and open debate. Well, what you said, um, what, what, what you said there, I think is very applicable because I think at a point that maybe it's happened cyclically, you know, since, uh, science, you know, since the, uh, the, the dawn of the, you know, the age of enlightenment and science and all that, maybe it's been happening cyclically, but it's certainly become more prevalent and more pervasive in this age than ever. And that is the idea of exactly what, uh, or Tyson, uh, talks about. And that is this idea that only science can tell you about the world. And, and I think that that is, again, that's, that's where they go wrong and they go too far and they, they suppose too much um, about their own abilities. I think technology, it's gotten to the point where people can now legitimately question, what is the end game and end goal of these scientists? Are they about, you know, I titled my book, Leaving Humanity, because I think science, in a real sense, has left humanity in the sense that they're no longer serving human purposes. Their goal is to serve science, is to serve the pursuit of supposed comprehensive understanding, uh, manipulating and controlling nature. And I think that's why they have no problem with, for example, trying to introduce the singularity, you know, the the age when uh, an artificial intelligence will be superior to humans in every respect. Why would you do that? Why would you want to do that? (laughs) I mean, as a human being, what it's almost like. You know how sometimes, you know, you hear about uh, people, they're in a job and, uh, well, their boss, you know, really that they're making too much money and, and they, they got somebody who they want to bring in more cheaply, you know, maybe it's, you know, for whatever reason, and they bring in your replacement. And then they say to you, oh, oh can you train this guy? Can, can he follow <laughs> you around and, and kind of work with you, you know? And boy, are you a sucker if you do that. <laughs> What what the hell are we doing? Even contemplating the idea of introducing, you know, this so-called AI singularity, an intelligence and a type of artificial being which is destined to really replace us, to usher in a post-human world, and then hope that we're going to merge with this, you know, technology or, or hope that this technology, I think Ben Gertzel puts it like, uh, you know, he was talking on London Real and he said, um, well, I think that, you know, we shouldn't suppose that the technology will, will be predisposed to necessarily want to destroy us, although it could, <laughs> he said, but, but let's hope. And if we train it the right way, it'll look upon us the way we look upon our parents and grandparents <laughs> and and it'll treat us you know with affection well who the hell wants that i mean th- this is crazy talk but i think way they come to this is because they don't they have a vision of humanity that is that is quite different than maybe mine is or maybe yours is yours is and i kind of break it down like this um they kind of see humanity as a, uh, you know, as a signpost up ahead, but something that's up ahead and then be in, in, the rear wi- in, in the rear view window, you know. It's just a point along the path of evolution, of, you know, of, of progress. There's a different 
sort of view of humanity, which I have. And that is, you know, we're created in the image of a creator. We may be imperfect and we certainly are imperfect, but the goal is not to progress past what we are to something completely alien and different than we are. The goal is to become more fully as we were intended to be. And that is a real difference from what they're preaching. And make no mistake, they're preaching it because it's it's not science at some level. It is as much a religion as anything else. I, I think you put your finger on an important idea at the end there, which is that it, the more people get away from um, a view of, of God as a creator, the more you fall back on the evolutionary mindset, which is that there's nothing special about humans. You know, the, the best you could say about them is that they're a stepping stone in the will of the universe. And H.G. Wells, he was one of these great technocrats. He, he was a huge collectivist, one of the uh, forerunners and big proponents of these world organizations that we have today. And he was actually one of the first human beings to have a fully scientific education. And he embraced evolution early on uh, in the late 19th century in, in London. And you can tell from his mindset that he has, humans are despicable for him, right? They're despicable, they're, an, they're animals. The best you could hope for is to corral them and to guide them, uh, their animal impulses in a particular way. So there, so there is a correlation between kind of the evolutionary atheistic mindset and a tendency towards uh, collectivism, technocracy, all of, all of these sorts of things. It's amazing to me that they, you know, these these people, uh, these these scientists who are so involved in genetic technology, and of course they have, you know, it's all being done, of course, to you know to to treat you know extreme medical conditions and whatever. And that's look, there are aspects of that which I I, th I think will be wonderful for people who are afflicted. But again, I think um, what they do is they begin with one thing and 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 they really go and they move to something else, which is quite different and a sign of the, the lack of boundaries. You know, H.G. Wells, if he really believes that humans are as flawed as he does, and I agree that we are flawed. You know, I, I think the solution for our flaws might be very different than what he proposes. But why, if we are all so flawed, do you take it upon yourself to then turn around and as genetic scientists will do, oh, let's design human beings. <laughs> I mean, if you are flawed, if you are capable of great evil, if you are, you know, if your view of things is self-interested and prone, as prone to the dark side and evil as to good, what makes you think that you can go down that road and somehow act with pure intentions and that it's all going to turn out well? So when, when, you know, C.S. Lewis, when he talked about um, designing ourselves, right, we will, we will make ourselves. And certainly that is the quest. But uh, I think there's a, there's a monkey wrench that, you know, that, uh, that he didn't see. And that is, you know what, it may not be us designing ourselves at some point. It may be AI messing around with organic, you know, matter, and doing what it wants with us. And, and so there are levels of hell, that, you know, coming down the pike when you, begin, when you begin thinking that you can act without boundaries. If you have a view, we are imperfect, but we are meant to be more perfectly what we were created to be, what we were intended to be. There's a certain dignity which you must accord our creation you would maybe be limited in what you propose to do to redesign that thing which is ultimately fashioned by a creator. But if you don't see us as a creation of a creator, then in a way that frees you and you become your own creator and you become boundless in your idea of what you think you can do to better yourself and maybe better others, whether they want to be bettered or not. With regard to genetics, to me, the dividing line is heritable gene editing. Are we going to go down that road? Are we going to begin introducing genetic changes to humans that can be passed on? To me, it's unfathomable that we would even be 
thinking of going there, it's unfathomable to me that we are not rising up more broadly and telling these people who are proposing these things, hold on, wait a minute, you don't get to decide how things get designed and propagated, especially human beings. But let's face it, everything, they're talking about all of organic life. They're talking about redesigning and, and you know, improving everything. They have no bounds. And this is dangerous. I would like to see all of these technocrats have a, po- a poster a, or a photo in front of them as they're working. Edmund Burke's famous line, Reflections on the Revolution in France, he says, we think that no discoveries are to be made in morality. I want to talk about the uh, the future with you, Joe, because this is a lot of the stuff that you write about. And in Trends Journal, you know, obviously you're talking about what is what is upcoming. What trends can we look at that are going to be reality in the upcoming years? What are some of the most pertinent trends, let's say, in technocracy that you see as likely to manifest themselves in the next 10 years? Well, um, I like to, you know, I mean, I like to go out even further than that, at least speculating. You know, there are things to, to me that just are so obvious. I don't know why we don't all get it at this point. They don't want us around. They don't need us. If you don't understand that, then then you're not a you haven't even touched the ball, you know you, you're just whiffing at the plate. You have to understand that those EVs they aren't being built for you. They want you in a smart city. They want you in a in a little apartment. You know, I, I mean, I read a, uh, a a beautiful short story, an amazing short story in sci-fi when I was a kid about this. Uh, about this world where it was incredibly overcrowded and people were consigned to these little rooms in these, you know, apartment houses and cities. And this one guy, um, what they would do is every year or, or even less than a year, they would come out with new regulations that literally cut your room size down just a little bit. And they would go in there and refashion everything. And you would have like your room would go from an eight by 10 to like maybe a seven by nine, you know? So they were squeezing people in tighter and tighter. And this guy, the, the, the interesting thing about the story is he punches a hole through a wall and there's this whole unexplored space that I guess the, you know, the people who ran the building d- didn't know about, you know, this one part of the building. And for a while he finds this beautiful open space But eventually he invites one person and then another person finds out about it. And eventually, you know, the place becomes just as crowded and then it all gets shut down. My point is they want you off the land. They want you, hey, get on the metaverse. You know, don't really travel anywhere. Don't go anywhere anymore. See, you're you're using too much carbon. You you know, we can't do that. So for you, let's let's go someplace virtually. Um, or as Ben Gertzel, you know, said on London Real, listen, you're going to be out of a job. AI is basically going to take over 90% of jobs within the next 10 years, you know, including yours and including yours, you know, not mine yet. I'm too important. And, and of course you, Brian, the, the host of this podcast, oh, you're, you're so insightful. It's not going to affect you, but, but most people are going to be out of a job. So, you know, maybe they're, they're going to be in their rooms and, and they're going to have a, a basic in, income and, and maybe they can put on their VR headsets and, and, and you know, just happily have, a, have a, a virtual relationship, you know, watch VR porn. Ready player one. Don't procreate, don't procreate, and then pass away because we don't need you anymore. We have now robotics and AI, and we just don't need the bulk of humanity. So, I mean, you know, the next 10 years, I think we're going to be facing more and more systemic pressures and regulations to t- kind of get us into more urban environments, you know, smart cities where we won't need, you know, we can walk to every place within 15 minutes. So you don't need your EV. See, we promised, we, we took away your gas car, but guess what? You're not getting the EV, you're getting public transport, or guess what? You're going to be able to walk everywhere. And we don't even really want you out of your apartment because COVID was such a great idea. and 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 you know, it made the world, you know, so much more peaceful and, and the world healed for a year while we all stayed inside, you know? I mean, it's that crazy, but people have to realize 
that's what the future is. The future is leaving you behind. You're not going to be part of it. Your genetics are not going to be part of it. Basically, they're going to be masters of the universe, you know, the tiny cabal of elites. There's going to be a class of technocrats needed for the time being to, you know, they're going to be, we're all technocrats now if, if we want a job. We're all going to be essentially helping AI to progress until the point when AI can progress on its own without us. But until that point, there'll be a class of technocrats. There won't be much else. That's the way they see it. 8 billion, 12 billion, 14 billion. The earth can't take it, you see. We need the carbon zero. But what, what that's all about, and people should just understand it, if you, you know, if you want to look at it realistically, that's their virtue flag. And that's all it is. They have to control. They have to, you know, they have their designs. They need a reason. They need a virtue reason for it. And that's what the carbon war is all about. It's providing them with that reason to say, well, you have to do this for the good of humanity, for the good of the earth. But it's all built on, you know, I, I wish I had Gerald's bu button right beside me because, you know, I'd use, I'd use his button. That's, that's really what the heart of that is. If I, if I were a sci-fi writer, the way I might write it, there might be these wild lands of the future, these wild spaces where there are freakish combinations of, of beasts and, and men and robots and, you know, everything that transhumanism is sort of proposing in a, in a utopian way is sort of a, a dystopia and a, a, a sort of jungle and ghetto of this endless experimentation, which they kind of, you know, still maybe the masters of the universe allow or they haven't completely stamped out. It's in, in certain regions, certain, you know, outlands. Maybe there are those types of, you know, communities and people, you know. It's the masters of the universe on huge swaths of land, beautiful, pristine land. It's the technocrats who need to exist for the time being, and they're in highly urban environments. And maybe somewhere, maybe there's some little island or some little, you know, partitioned off area of the world where they keep a, a supply of natural humans. <laughs> Maybe they keep them uh, in a medieval state, you know, pre-technological, and they don't even know that the rest of the world even exists, you know, as, as it is. And they use that genetic pool as needed, you know, um, when they need some natural genetics. <laughs> and, you know, it, it, it really can get that crazy. Well, I, I can't, tell you how much joe that what you just said there makes me feel much more comfortable than all this dignity of man stuff that you were saying earlier in the show um just, just <laughs> much more in, much more in line with uh, the stuff that we talk about on the show but um so let me ask you this because you've you've laid out a pretty scary portrait of how you see the future i know a lot of other people who kind of see some of these things coming and they have they've booked booked it out of the united states they're in the, the far corners of the world, Uruguay, et cetera, which are very far um, off of the beaten path. They're checking out, they're going off the grid, they're doing all these sorts of things. You've said, you know, you're, you're still living in, in New York. You're, you're pretty public about your stuff. Um, you're not necessarily going off grid. Why not, if you feel this way, check out? I've always been kind of out there in the public in one way or another, uh, just, as, just, just because of different endeavors that I've had. Now, obviously, uh, you know, I'm doing the Trends Journal. I mean, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm out there every week. Uh, when, I, when I first talked to Gerald about, you know, writing for the journal and what I wanted to do, what I wanted to write, you know, he said, well, you know, he goes, you can write. And he goes, of course, you can do it. You know, you don't have to put a byline on it. I said, why wouldn't I want a byline? <laughs> of course, I want my byline, you know. Um, and he said, well, you know, some of our writers, they don't want to be, you know, blah, blah, blah. And I said, no, 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 man. Uh, put my name on it. Put my name on it. You know, my view for myself is that if you're a public person, if you're out there and you're speaking about this stuff, um, 
look, if they if they want to know anything about you, they're probably going to be able to, especially me, uh, you know, because I've never really taken care throughout my whole life. So my view being a more public person is, hey, just out yourself. You ain't going to play any gotcha games with me. Now, it only works so far. If you've, you know, if you've murdered somebody or you, you're evading taxes big time, then I guess you can't do what I'm talking about. But for me, it's no problem. Yeah, no, there's there's obviously a lot of freedom in just simply having that view of there is nothing to hide. And I respect that as well. I think that it is a bit of a psyop that there's no privacy to be had. Do you have any kind of final final topic uh, for people maybe interested in privacy technocracy, the future, where things are going? Any final topic that we haven't discussed yet that you would like to say a few things on? I would just say uh, that people need to uh, think about the uh, what our founders what they what they were addressing when they made this you know this thing called our constitution and sort of you know fought that revolution and tried to come to a form of, of government where there would be a decent respect for the dignity and rights of, of individual people. And I think, you know, what they were getting at and what they were trying to do and what we should really hark back to and, and get reacquainted with were are, are the problem the problem of power and how do we deal with the problem of power? And um, I think that's, again, it's where technocrats go wrong is, is, is that they, they don't acknowledge and they don't admit that um, power is corrupting, that power concentrated is power that almost certainly will do more evil than good. Our founders understood it. They, you know, they, there's the, the line they, they bound, you know, they tried to bound power in chains of different checks and balances. I think people need to really think about, okay, you say you're for democracy, for example. Well, how much does your democracy and your democratic vote matter when elites are spending $500 million on an election? Your, your vote yeah your vote means nothing your vote has been completely wiped out and canceled how much does your democratic principles and your democratic vote matter when you're voting for globalist organizations and and you want more remote power more power for these remote more centralized and and more world and globalist because guess what your fraction of 8 billion is a lot less than your fraction of, say, 2 million in your city. If we're going to have this democratic thing, we're going to be voting, right? We're going to have representatives and all the rest of it. But let's keep power local. People have to understand that if you are truly for democratic principles, you cannot be a globalist. <laughs> it, is, it is the opposite. It is directly undermining any democratic function or principle to have powers be that remote. And I think people need to think about that. They need to understand that we have to address the power of elites. We have to, we have to, their anti-democratic power has to be addressed. So these elites, they are not entitled they are not necessarily to be looked up as 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 super well they're just better at it than i am they're just they're just better than 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 me in some way what they have done is largely they have learned to manipulate and game the system against you and we shouldn't allow it it's happening right now with chat gpt they swallowed the internet they swallowed all of our contributions all of our human knowledge and now they're saying, see ya, goodbye, we don't need you. We don't need your website, by the way. We're not going to point back to your website. If you ask ChatGPT a question, he's just going to answer you directly. Okay, he's just going to give you the knowledge. He's just going to write you a blog article. He'll just tell you the information and screw your website. We don't need to go to your website anymore. I mean, do people realize what the hell's going on with that? We have to understand the problem of power and we have to deal with elites. I'm not saying French Revolution 
Although we need something, we need something pretty radical at this point. We need to really cut down their power. And we need to think about that for the sake of the way things are going to go. Because if they get to decide, we ain't in the picture, we ain't in the future. 